is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! Come on, make some noise! Well, how do you make noise? Well, to know that, you gotta know your sound. All sound is vibration. Here, take a closer look. You see? You got it. Whoa! Okay, let's try this again. All sound is vibration. The string of this guitar vibrates, which vibrates the air around it, causing the sound that you hear. Your vocal cords vibrate in your throat, causing you to make a sound. Look at this thing. See how it's shaking back and forth? It's vibrating. Things that make a high sound, they vibrate faster. Vibrating really fast. <laughs> Things that make a low sound, vibrate slowly. <laughs> high note, vibrating fast. Ramona, just put him up high. Put him up, yeah, higher. Good. Hey. Grab it. Grab it. Huh? Gravity makes things fall. But well, where do they fall? They fall down. Oh. Towards the center of the earth. Gravity. Yeah. It fell, didn't it? So, the earth causes gravity, right? Well, yes, gravity. Oh, not, come on. Everything that has mass has gravity. Gravity. But the Earth has so much mass that the gravity produced by everything else is like nothing. I mean, forget about it. But let's say I was in space with, uh, with this chicken. I would have gravity, and I could exert a gravitational force on this chicken. And if I get my angles right, I might be able to get the chicken to orbit me. Like, like a moon. Behold, my chicken moon. Huh? Gravity. But let's get serious. What causes gravity? We don't know. Ah! But what we do know is that without gravity, there would be no universe as we know it. No you, no me, no chicken moon. I'd miss my chicken moon. Chicken moon, you what? Gravity. Like it or not, the universe wouldn't exist without it. You like the sign? I'll give you a good deal. Uh, half off. So you want to generate some electricity. But what do you choose to generate that electricity? Hydro, nuclear, coal, solar? Who knows? I do, I know, and soon, so will you. In order to generate electricity, you need to turn the generator. Turn the generator. One of the most common ways to turn the generator is to use one of these. It's a steam engine. Usually they're a lot bigger. You see, you heat the water to boil it and turn it to steam, which works a piston, which turns the generator. Huh? Pretty amazing, right? But what it really boils down to is heating water to make steam. Boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Coal power. Burn the coal to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Natural gas, that's different, right? Nope, burn the gas to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Nuclear power, that's different, right? Nope, it creates heat, 
which you use to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Wind power. We don't even need heat for that. Just use the wind to spin the fan to turn the generator. Hydropower. Just pour water across something that spins to turn the generator. No matter what, making electricity always comes down to turning the generator. It's always yada yada, yada yada, turn the generator. Except for solar. Solar does not work like that. But other than that, it's always yada yada, yada yada, to turn the generator. And now you know your electricity generation. <laughs> Hey, Ramona, you want to come and give me a hand over here? My arm is getting tired. Vibration and frequency. What's the difference? They're all connected. Ta-da! Now, whoa. Wow. Vibration is things going back and forth. Back and forth. And back and forth. It's a cycle. Cycle, 25 bucks. Oh yeah, it's the wrong kind of cycle, never mind. Well, if that's vibration, then what's frequency? Well, frequency is a measure of how fast or slow, how frequent those vibrations happen. Look at this bowling ball. It is swinging back and forth, but not very fast. You could say it has a low frequency. We measure all kinds of things by the frequency. This thing is terrifying. When you turn the dial on your radio, you're tuning in to different frequencies of radio waves. Hey, look at this punching balloon. It's going very fast. You could say it has a high frequency. <laughs> so, now you know. Vibration is something going back and forth, and frequency is how quickly it does it. Yeah. Ramona, the bowling ball keeps coming through everything. How do you turn it off? Oh, hey, how you doing? Ugh, shut the door, it's cold out there. Ugh. Cold enough for you, huh? Well, that's nothing. Let me tell you, you know what temperature water freezes at? Yeah, zero degrees Celsius. But even that is nothing. <sighs> Let's say it's winter in Winnipeg. It could get down to minus 20, maybe even minus 40. But even that's nothing. Liquid nitrogen, minus 196 degrees Celsius. But even that's nothing. The vacuum of space. <laughs> Minus 271 degrees Celsius. But even that's nothing. So, what's the coldest temperature? What? What's the coldest temperature you can have? It's called absolute zero. Minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, all the little wiggling that particles do comes to a stop. Everything is frozen. No more movement, no more energy. Everything stops. It doesn't get any colder than that. Absolute zero is the ultimate nothing. Brr, time to get your mittens on. Oh, hey, how you doing? You, you want to buy something? I got a lot of stuff here, and I got a special today only. Potential energy. Huh? I will throw in some potential energy with any order. You see this stuff on the shelves here? The stuff on the higher shelves has more potential energy than the stuff on the lower shelves. Don't believe me? Here, hold on, hold on. Look at this state-of-the-art traffic controller. Right now, it's sitting up here on this high shelf. Now, if it were to fall, it would be going fast, which means it would have a lot of kinetic energy. <laughs> you see, when it fell down, it had enough kinetic energy to completely break itself apart. Um, yeah, well, that's the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. Look at this bagel, just sitting here, not moving, minding its own business on top of this ramp. It's all potential energy and no kinetic energy. And 
And when it gets to the floor, it's all kinetic energy and no potential energy. <laughs> and now it has neither because it's on the floor and it's not moving. <laughs> Five second rule. And now you know your energy. So what do you say? You want this thing? Uh, tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a discount because, because you know it's it's gently used. Hey, I'll even throw in this bagel, huh? Also, gently used. Okay, now that's too far left. I don't know what you think. Oh, hey, I don't suppose you're going on vacation anytime soon. Well, if you haven't decided where, may I suggest underwater. But don't forget to pack the most important thing when you go. Hat? Nah. Ukulele? Nah, forget about it. Oh, chicken? No. Sunscreen? Forget about it. Teddy? No, if you're going underwater, the most important thing you gotta pack is air. Hmm? You see, human beings have been coming up with ways to go underwater for a long time. But the thing is, you gotta bring air with you because, you know, breathing is, is good. <gasps> Check this out. It's a diving bell! One of the first ways humans used to be able to take air with them when they went underwater. You see, it's a big, heavy bell, and it's lowered from a ship above on a rope. And when it gets lowered into the water, it traps a bubble of air underneath. So you can swim around underwater, but then when you need to breathe again, you don't have to go all the way back up. You just pop under the bell and take another breath. <sighs> Bells like this were actually much bigger when they used to use them for diving to hold more air. Huh? Ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. What do you think? You want this? No? Uh, it's okay. I got something else. Hold on. Check this out. It's an old-timey diving suit. Air is pumped in through these hoses here, which means the diver has a constant supply of air, which means he can stay underwater longer. What do you think? You, like, no? Okay, hold, hold on. I got something else. I got something else. Uh, um, uh, yeah. This is it, the ultimate in bringing air with you. The scuba suit, this tank, holds compressed air, which means it can carry a lot of air with you, which means you can stay underwater for longer. So I'll tell you what, I'll wrap up all three things. What do you say? Yeah, you'll take them? Okay, great. Let me just wrap them up for you. Come on, Teddy, let's go find the bag. So, you would like to move electricity from here to there. Well, what you need, my friend, is a conductor. All right, a little more arpeggio this time. No, not that kind of conductor. All aboard! No, not that kind of conductor either. This kind of conductor. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, that's just a piece of metal. Well, that's right. That's because you're smart. This is a circuit. Electricity flows from this battery along the wires and into the light bulb. But Sal, you cleverly observe, the light bulb is not lit. This is true. That is because we have a gap in the circuit. And air is not a good conductor of electricity. Is metal a good conductor of electricity? Let us find out. <laughs> metal is a good conductor of electricity. What about wood? Nope. What about this horseshoe? Is a good conductor. Will this sandwich conduct electricity? Nope. No. What about this plastic fish? Nope. What about this pickle? No. Pickle is not a good conductor. That's why we make electrical wires out of copper and not pickles. <laughs> you know, in case you were wondering. Oh, hey, how you doing? Let me guess, you want to build a strong structure, something that'll stand the test of time. 
Well, you know you gotta use the right kind of shapes. Look at this, a square. Now squares have gotta be strong, right? Well, maybe. Maybe if you press straight down on it, but watch as I push to the side. Oh no, the thing that I have built is now collapsing because squares aren't in fact strong after all. If only I had listened to Sal's sage advice. Yeah, squares aren't gonna cut it. Fortunately, there's a shape that's strong in all kinds of ways, a triangle. Okay, so you heard of triangles before, good for you. But look at this, you can push down from the top and it doesn't move, or you can push from the side and it doesn't move. Triangles are awfully pointy. How do I build with them? Observe, ha <laughs> ha. Triangle here, triangle there, platform on top. And watch, no matter how I try to shift it, it stays solid. And check this out. Triangle here, second triangle there, and a third triangle shape here. That's like three triangles for the price of two. Huh, that's a good deal. So there you have it. The triangle, one of the greatest shapes to build with. Oh, hey, good to see you. Speaking of seeing things, let's talk about the rainbow. All the colors of the spectrum organized in a beautiful pattern. But what are the different colors? I mean, what makes them different? Well, it all has to do with the electromagnetic spectrum. This is visible light. All the colors of the rainbow. And take a look at that little black line that goes up and down there. That's the frequency of the light. Light is a wave. You see the wave length is a little wider out here on the red side, and it's a little closer together here on the violet side. That's because every color of light has a different length of wave or wave length. And that is what makes them different when we look at them. But if you think that's all there is to the electromagnetic spectrum, then you're mistaken. So what happens over here on the red side? Does it keep going? Yeah, it does. What? Look, we got infrared here, and then we got microwaves. These are the same kind of waves you use in your oven. And then we got radio waves, which are the same kind of waves you use in your radio. They're all part of the same thing as visible light. Huh? Let's take a look at the other end. Remember these short wavelengths over here beside violet? Well, does that keep going? Yeah, if they keep getting shorter, you get ultraviolet and then x-rays and then gamma rays, huh? Pretty amazing. And look, it's all connected. From radio waves to gamma rays to visible light in between, it's all frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> How is this staying up? So everything outside of the visible spectrum is invisible, right? Wrong! Ha-ha! <laughs> Bam! Huh? That is an X-ray, a picture we can take using this part of the spectrum. We can use special cameras to see outside of the visible spectrum. Huh? Huh? Right? <laughs> yeah! You get... You, okay, you got it. Huh? And look at these. These are night vision goggles. They help you see in the dark. They use part of the spectrum called infrared. For those of you keeping score, that's this part of the spectrum right here. Pretty neat, right? I would sell you these, but they're already spoken for. Oh, and here he comes now. Hey, Sal. Hey, how you doing? You got those goggles I ordered? Yeah, go ahead, help yourself. Thanks for putting them aside. Can I put them on my tab? Yeah, no problem. All right, thanks, Sal. Okay, see you later. Nice kid. He's always in a rush, though. Hey, Ramona, you change your hair? Yeah, it's nice. It's like doing this now. But used to be, used to, but now it's, yeah, I like it. You should give me the name of your guy, because I wanted to, hey, oh, hey, how are you? You ever think to yourself, no matter what I do, I can't seem to get anywhere. I can't, I can't get enough traction. Well, you, my friend, need some more friction. Which one of these two shoes has more friction, hmm? Take a closer look. Huh? Huh? Right, bam, this one. This one doesn't have a lot of treads. It doesn't have a lot of friction. But this one, it's got metal spikes on the bottom. This is called a cleat, and the spikes are for helping you grip onto the grass when you're playing soccer or golf, increasing its friction. Why do you think skis 
are smooth on the bottom. Come on, look at that. It's so smooth and, and glidey. My hand just, I can barely even touch the surface. It just slides right off. It's sort of glidey and smooth. They're smooth to help you glide across the snow, reducing their friction. Why doesn't this box slide down this ramp? Friction. This roller skate has wheels. Wheels reduce friction. But when I push the roller skate, how come it doesn't just keep rolling forever and ever and ever and ever? Then going all the way around the world and writing a memoir. Say it with me. Friction, louder. Friction, can't hear you. Friction, a little too loud. Friction, ease it back. Friction. How can I hang on to this rope without falling? Friction. How can I, how can I jump down on the floor without falling over. Friction. And now you know your friction. Your friction. Your, your friction. Come on. Uh-oh. Uh oh, uh, Ramona, the friction sign is broken. <laughs> Reset. Uh-oh. This is a magnet. This is a magnet. This is a magnet. This is a shoe. What's the difference? To know that, you have to know your magnets. This is a donut. It does not stick to this magnet. This is a spoon. It sticks to this magnet. These paper clips stick to this magnet. This shoe does not. So what has attracted the magnets? Only things that are ferromagnetic. Here's the difference. Horseshoe, horseshoe magnet. This one is a magnet. This one is not. But the horseshoe sticks to the horseshoe magnet because this one's a magnet and this one is ferromagnetic. Only things that are ferromagnetic are attracted to magnets. Things that are not attracted to magnets, they're not ferromagnetic. Plastic, banana, mitten, sandwich, magazine. No, but how do you know? Do you go around the world sticking a magnet to every single thing one at a time? Hey, Ma, I need you to come over. I need to see if you're ferromagnetic. No, ferromagnetic. No, you don't need to do that. First of all, only metals are ferromagnetic. So that eliminates all your clothing, your luncheon meats, your magazines, what have you. Everything that's not metal, you don't need to worry about. You, never mind, Ma, it doesn't matter. But this clock is metal. It doesn't stick. Well, not all metals are ferromagnetic. Mainly just the ones with iron, nickel, or cobalt. And there you have it. Now you know your magnets. I hit the phone on the magnet there. Okay, uh, can you hear me, Ma? Hang up the phone. Hang up. Hang up the phone, Ma. <laughs> yeah! My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! Yeah, thanks, Ramona. And give me one of them fizzy drinks. Not too fizzy, just sort of medium fizzy. Thanks a lot. Hello, do you have trouble knowing what is a solid, liquid, or gas? Are you confused by jello? I mean, which is it? Is it a solid or is it a liquid? Water is a liquid, but what about when it's ice? Well, you gotta know your states of matter. There are three main states of matter. Solid, liquid, and gas. And there are three rules that you need to figure out which one of them is which. Does it flow? Does it fit the shape of its container? And can you squeeze it? Rule number one, does it flow? Solid, liquid, gas. Here's a gas, does it flow? Do the particles pour over each other and cascade down? Yeah, yeah they do. Does a liquid flow? Yeah, yeah, it does. Does a solid? Nope. 
Rule number two, what happens when you put it in a container? Does it take the shape of the container? Gases take the shape of the container. Liquids takes the shape of the container. Solids do not take the shape of their container. No! I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I get the whole pouring and taking the shape of the container, but come on. Liquids and gases, they do both of those things. Well, it all comes down to rule number three. Can you squeeze it? Now, solids, you, you, can't, you can't really squeeze them. Liquids, you can't really squeeze them. Gases, ha-ha, bam, you can squeeze them. You see, gases compress. Liquids and solids, they don't really compress very well. The other difference between gases and liquids is Gases will take the shape and the volume of the container they're put in. Liquids don't do that. So there you go. Solid, liquid, gas. And the rules. Does it flow? Does it take the shape of the container? And can you squeeze it? Now you know your states of matter. That'll be 650. Cash only. This is ferrofluid. It is ferromagnetic, which means it's attracted to magnets. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it's not that interesting. Well, watch as I put it next to this magnet. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And because it's a liquid, it behaves in very interesting ways. Watch this. Unlike most things ferromagnetic, like paper clips or iron filings, Ferrofluid is a liquid, which means it behaves in a unique way. The spikes it creates are following the magnetic field lines of the magnet. You can see the magnetic field in 3D. It's even more impressive when we max it out. This is ferrofluid outside of a glass jar. Now, it's sitting in a pool around this electromagnet. And this is a dial, which I can use to change the voltage of the electromagnet, making the magnet stronger. Watch this. Changing the current going to the spiral in the middle turns it into a magnet. The more current I put in, the stronger that magnet becomes, allowing the ferrofluid to climb the spiral to the top. And remember, even though it looks all spiky, it's still a liquid. I will demonstrate with my plastic spoon. And watch this, when I turn the magnet off, it stops being spiky. Turn it on. Turn it off. Science. Ugh. The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic. And you will be granted entry. Well, Fuzzix, who is the next applicant for the Wizard Academy? Overwhelmo. Indeed it is I, Overwhelmo. And prepare to be overwhelmed. Would you be flabbergastified if I balanced this coin on its end? Not really, no. But would you be impressed if I was to balance this coin on top of this coin! Possibly. Prepare to be flustered and stupefied. Stoopy. Stoopy flustered as I balance three coins on their ends on top of this glass. Well, that certainly would seem like magic. Let us see. OK. No pressure, Overwhelmo. You can do this. And now I say a magic word. A magic word! Ha 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 ha! And now you must let me into your academy. Wait. What's under the cloth? What what cloth? This cloth? Nothing! Oh! Is that a magnet? This? No! The pull of the magnet is what's keeping those coins up. The magnet is just strong enough to keep the coins from falling. No, this is set set dressing. It's just for... It was a good trick, but it's science, not magic. Well, yes. And you will see! You will see! I will be back! I, Overwhelmo, will return! And I will do such magic that you will need extra socks, because I will knock them off! With my magic, you will need at least two pairs of socks, maybe three pairs of socks. We can still see you! No, you can't! 
As you may have already guessed, today is about friction. And here's a really easy friction experiment you can do at home. All you need is a piece of wood. You don't need the frame and you don't have to uh, do anything fancy to it. Just put one end up on a couch or a coffee table and make a nice ramp. Then you want something to slide down that ramp. And I like to use a piece of wood. Now check it out. Wood ramp, wood block. The friction is so much that the wood slides to there. Now what I like to do is take a little flag and mark the results. Recording the results is good science. Now here's where it gets fun. Get another surface and attach it to the wood, like carpet and wood. Let's see how far this goes. Hmm, not as good. All right, record the results. Cardboard. Ooh, nicely done, cardboard. Foam. And this wood has been waxed, like on a floor wax, which makes it nice and slippery. Let's see how that does. Ooh. And now the ultimate ice attached to wood. This is actually harder to do than I thought. All right, let's try it out. Not a big surprise right there. And get this, once you've done all of that, you can change the surface of the ramp. You can go to waxed wood, carpet, foam, cardboard. Well, and, and well, yeah, you get the idea. Record all the results, compare them, and there you go. Friction ramp experiment. And that's what we're gonna be maxing out today. So come on, let's go. This is a string. You can pull a string, but you can't push a string. Well, you can. You can push a string. It, you really can. Okay, quit it. Quit it. This little contraption works sort of like a baseball pitching machine, but in miniature. See, there are two motors here, and the wheels spin together to shoot things out this way. Things like this craft stick. Watch this. Whoa! Let's watch that again. Whoa! <laughs> but now, watch as I put a large loop of string through. What? <laughs> Pushing string. How does this happen? It... Hello? I don't suppose it's the Magnus effect? Uh, no, it's not the Magnus effect. No, that's it's all right. I'll be in my lair if you need okay. me. Okay, right. Bye. Right. Where was I? Uh, I believe you were at, uh, the reason why this works is... Right, pushing string. How does this happen? It's all because of inertia. Check it out. The wheels are pushing the string through fast. It's got some weight and it's got some speed, which means it has some inertia. So when it goes this way, it wants to keep going this way. But it goes all the way to the end and then, because it's a loop, gets sucked back in this way. Which means all of this inertia, you can sort of overcome gravity. Gravity. Pushing straight. Science. Okay. So here we go. Amazing. The friction ramp. It's pretty simple. You just take, um, I've got blocks of wood with different surfaces. Amazing. And then you just slide them down the ramp. All right. So cool. Yeah. So what if, um, to max it out, what if this is us? We're a block of wood? N no, I mean like we are on the block of wood oh. and then we can tr try changing the Bottom. I guess a block of wood isn't the right thing to use, though. Right, yeah. Maybe we could use, like, a like a sled. Oh, yeah, okay, like a, right, uh, like a snow sled. Mm. That's a great idea. Okay, so yeah. we'll tell you what. I will portal in a sled for Are us. Are you sure you want to portal it in? I'm sure. Just okay. stand Just stand back, okay. though. Okay. Ha! Ah, there we go. Maxed out friction slide! <laughs> you ready, Sarah? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. All right. Sarah and I pushed each other around on the sled, which was fun. <laughs> But it was also tiring. It's uh, it's pretty hard. This is a uh... my turn, my turn. All right. Oh, yeah. Whoa, friction. Yeah, friction. Yeah, yeah, friction. But we soon realized it'd be pretty hard to measure how much friction there was. You know how hard you were pushing? Like, I had no idea how hard I was pushing. A lot, but that doesn't really help in science terms. So exactly. What do we do? Well, with your first experiment, you used a ramp. Could we maybe put a ramp up in here? 
In here? In here, yeah. I guess. Uh... Then we can measure also how far we go so we know how much friction is being used. Uh, right, so we have our control and then we have all the, just like the blocks. Exactly, just like the blocks. Okay, great. So we'll get the ramp, we'll get a bunch of wood, right. yes. we'll get some tools. Yeah. Mouse trap. Uh. Um, like I said, we are going to be using uh, <laughs> mouse traps. Mouse traps as a form of uh, propulsion. That's the force that makes things go. And we are going to be making a boat go. And what is the thing that's going to make this boat go? A mouse. Uh, oh. Oh, it's not set. Sorry, I'm really jumpy. Anyway, we're gonna be using a mouse trap. And don't worry, no mice are gonna be harmed in the making of this or any Science Max episode, but mouse traps are really great because they can store energy in the spring. If you see, there's a spring that makes this bar want to snap back, but we can put energy into the spring and store it and then use that energy as it unwinds the spring to propel our boat but it's a little more complicated than just this. So come on, I'll show you. What we're gonna do is build this. This is the mousetrap boat, and it works like this. I've got the mousetrap, and it's attached to a long arm. That arm has a string on it, and it goes around the paddle wheel, and as the mousetrap unwinds, the paddle wheel spins like that, which pushes the boat forward. Now, it looks kind of complicated, but it's actually quite simple to make, and here's what you need. My mousetrap boat is made with styrofoam, craft sticks, and elastics. You'll also want a pencil, plastic drink caps, a shish kebab skewer, small zip ties, string, and of course, your mousetrap. Now, mousetraps can hurt your fingers, so get an adult to help you when you use it. Start with two pieces of styrofoam. I like to cut mine into this shape, but the only really important thing is that they're the same size. Your paddle wheel is made from a circle of styrofoam with it penciled through the middle, and it will go across like this. To make the paddle wheel, I use cut pieces of craft stick, or they can be plastic, and make some cuts and then put them in like this, and that is what will make your paddles on the paddle wheel, because that's the wheel and that's the paddle. Paddle wheel. <laughs> that's why they call it that. Stick drink caps to the ends of the pencil after sticking it through the styrofoam. I like to use a few craft sticks and elastics to help give the styrofoam strength. Next is the mousetrap, which you want to glue down to a frame of four craft sticks. Attach the frame to the boat with elastics, then attach the shish kebab skewer or a pencil to the mousetrap with zip ties. I like to put some craft sticks on the end to make it easier to tie the string to it. Wrap the other end around the paddle wheel pencil, and remember you need enough string so that your stick can lie flat. Okay. Let's try it out. Wind up the paddle wheel. This'll be a little hard as the spring will pull back, but that's where you're storing the energy. And when it's wound up, put it in the water and... Let it go. The paddle wheel turns because the mouse trap is transferring energy that we put in earlier, and it goes all the way. We stored the energy in the tension of the spring. Now that tension is pulling the mouse trap, the stick, and the string, which turns the paddle wheel and makes the boat go. Mouse trap powered boat! If you want more detailed instructions or other designs, look up Mousetrap Boat. And there you have it, the Mousetrap powered paddle wheel boat. And this is what we're going to max out today. Come on. Greetings, Science Maximites. Today we're using fizzy drinks in our experiments. And a fizzy drink is just water with bubbles of carbon dioxide gas dissolved in it. So I thought since we exhale carbon dioxide, I could make a fizzy drink by just blowing bubbles in this water. Doesn't seem to be working though, does it? I don't see any bubbles, do you? No. Hmm. Water does absorb carbon dioxide gas, but I don't have a fizzy drink. Weird. Time to check the book of science. Oh, in order to make bubbles, you have to have pressure. So... This is an air compressor. It takes air and compresses it, puts it under pressure. So... Hmm. The container needs to be pressurized. Okay. When you get a container of a fizzy drink, the carbon dioxide gas is put in there under pressure, and it stays in there under pressure until you release it. That's the sound of the pressure being released. 
And when it is released, the carbon dioxide gas starts to expand. And when it expands, it creates bubbles. And that's what makes your fizzy drink. This process takes a while to run out, but eventually it will become flat. No more bubbles. But what if there was a way to release all of that carbonation all in one go? Well, there is. And for this experiment, all you need is your favorite brand of fizzy drink, Science Max brand Diet Science Cola. 100% science, zero calories. And your favorite candy, like these science experiments. All the minty flavor that comes from pure science. So, all you need to do is open this up. Open this up. Take one of these and put it in here with an adult's permission because it can get kind of messy. Whoa. What's going on here is all of the carbonation that was in the bottle is now being released much more rapidly than it would have been before. Now, why does this happen? Well, if you look at a carbonated beverage, you'll see that the bubbles don't come from everywhere. They come from the inside of the glass, or in this case, a lot are coming from the straw. And that's because the carbon dioxide bubbles like to find a little imperfection, something to hold on to in order to expand and bubble out. And a candy such as this has a ton of little tiny microscopic imperfections. So when you drop it in, there's a lot more places for the bubbles to attach, and that makes the carbonation happen a lot quicker. But remember, this is not a chemical reaction. It all has to do with carbonation. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Air pressure, more pressure, less pressure, and of course, we're gonna be maxing out this experiment. Hey, Science Maximites, I... Oh, ah! Ugh, slippery. But that's okay, because today we're talking about friction. Friction is a force that is everywhere and happens when any one thing rubs against any other thing. We do lots of things to increase friction, like, uh, like wear shoes with big treads on them. And we can do things to reduce friction, like the experiment we're doing today. We're gonna build a hover disk, and it's very easy. You take some cardboard and cut it into a circle, just like this. Then put a hole in the middle of the circle. You might want an adult to help you with that. And then take a plastic drink bottle cap, like this. I like the ones, use the ones that uh, you get on sport bottles because they have a little nozzle that pops open or closed. And then you glue it around the circle and you get this. Then you need a balloon. So you blow up your balloon. I know you know that step. And then twist the balloon so it doesn't get away from you. When it's nice and twisted, you can stick it over the drink bottle cap like this, and then untwist it. And this is why I like to use the plastic drink bottle caps that come from sport bottles, because you can open it when you want. And when you do, your disc rides on a cushion of air reducing the friction with the table, and it's almost like it's sliding on ice. You can also use CDs if you want to do a different design. Just make sure you're using CDs you never want to listen to again. Now, if any of this is too fast, don't worry. You can always go to the Science Max website where we have all of the instructions. This is a basketball. It bounces. This is a golf ball. It bounces but it never bounces as high as where I dropped it from. But watch as I put the golf ball on top of the basketball. Whoa! Why does the golf ball bounce higher than where I dropped it from? How is this possible? I only bounce the golf ball from one meter high. So what's going on? Well, as the basketball hits the ground, it compresses, storing the potential energy of its bounce, about to give that energy back as it bounces up again. But this energy works as a springboard for the golf ball. And since the golf ball has a lot less mass than the basketball, the upwards kinetic energy of the basketball is given to the golf ball. So, let's max it out. Ball, on a ball, on a ball. Three ball bounce. Ball, on a ball, on a ball, on a ball. Quadruple ball bounce. Oh. 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 
go wait. Turns out getting four balls to drop straight down on top of each other is pretty difficult. So, we know the mass of the ball is important. Why don't we max it out in a different way? This is a Swiss ball for exercising. It has a lot more mass than a golf ball. So, let's try it out. There you go. The transfer of energy between balls. A great way to lose golf balls. All right, pliers, battery, copper wire. Now, if you've already done the electromagnet experiment, here's another experiment that uses all the same materials, plus these. Ha! Neodymium magnets, some of the strongest magnets you can get. So, here's what you need. A battery, some neodymium magnets the same diameter as your battery, copper wire, and some pliers. So here's what you do. First thing is you put the batteries and the magnets together, like that. Then what you want to do is bend the wire so it's touching the top of the battery and goes around the battery and then touches the magnets at the bottom. Here's what that might look like. I say might because you can do any shape you want. I've made a coil here, and if you put it over the battery, you'll see it only touches the very top of the battery and the magnets at the bottom. And if I let it go, it spins! It's a homopolar motor. What happens is the battery sends an electric current through the copper wire, and that turns it into an electromagnet, which is attracted to the magnets at the bottom, and it spins. So, now, let's max it out. Ha-ha! A D-cell battery, which is larger and, of course, larger neodymium magnets. And you do the same thing. Make a coil that only touches the battery at the top and at the magnet, and... Ha-ha! It spins! Maxed out homopolar motor. But don't worry, this is not the biggest size we're gonna do. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Maxed out homopolar motor. I have 27 D cell batteries, a giant copper tube, and a neodymium magnet. So I'm just gonna, and then we get, get rid of that. Put this down. Okay, so the first thing I do is attach the neodymium magnet to uh, the batteries. And I've got all the batteries taped together here so they'll sort of stand up like, like this, huh? <laughs> Giant stack of D-cell batteries. Okay, now what I do is I take the copper coil. I take the copper coil. Um, I need to get, I need to get. Okay, hold on, hold on. I got this. I just need to get the copper coil there. <laughs> I did it. Okay, so I take the copper and I put it on top of the D-cell batteries like this, and then I let it go! <laughs> let it go! Nope, whoa! Homopolar motor! Okay, so that didn't work, but that's okay. I like it when it doesn't work, because that's science. It's not science if it works perfectly every time. I mean, you, you gotta have some room for improvement. <laughs> A delicious plate of cheese and crackers, my favorite snack. But these crackers are pretty salty, so I should probably pour myself a glass of water first, huh? No! My cheese and crackers! Why? Why does this happen? Why does the water stick to the glass? Well, because of science. And the reason why it happens gets a little complicated, but it boils down to this one simple thing. Water likes to stick to things. Huh? huh? Did you see? Did you see how it's stuck? No, of course you didn't. You know why? Because it only sticks on a small scale. See those drops of water? That's water sticking to the surface. But it only works when the surface tension of the water is less than the force of gravity, which is why water drops fall when they get bigger. So it sticks to things. That still doesn't explain why you can pour water out of some containers without any drips, and other containers make it nearly impossible. <laughs> It's all about the angle. Water will flow very easily when there isn't a large change in direction, like around the curved top of this glass. 
But when there's a big change in direction, like at the mouth of this teapot, the water can't make that turn as easily. This is also why pouring from a full glass is much messier than one that's less full. Pouring out of a full glass, the water only needs to change direction this much to flow down the side. But from a half full glass, the water would need to change direction this much. So all this happens because water likes to stick to things. So let's do an experiment and coat this glass with hydrophobic spray. Now, hydrophobic coatings repel water. So if it's repelling the water from the outside of the glass, will we still have the same problem? Well, let's find out. Hydrophobic coated glass, non-hydrophobic coated glass, or just regular glass. Water likes to stick to surfaces, but it can't stick to one coated in hydrophobic coating. That's impressive. Should we try something else? Well, that's one way to solve the dribbling glass problem. Except you can't coat your glasses at home with hydrophobic coating because it's not good to eat. The secret is using a container that has a very sharp angle between where you're pouring the water and the underside of the glass, like this jug. And there you go. Now I can enjoy a nice glass of water with my cheese and crackers. Uh, oh, right, I am. Um, wait, hold on, I can re, I will remake the crackers into, see, look, see, it's just, it's fine. It's fine, I'm not really gonna eat that, I'm just kidding. Chris and I are maxing out our hydraulic crusher. Yes, yes, before we get to that, I have a little game I wanna play. Okay, great. Great, you can pick either the small one. The big one. The okay. <laughs> so what's the game? Simple thumb war, uh, I'm gonna press down this side, you press down that side, we'll see you win. Okay, okay ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. Oh, wow, that was really tough. Why was that so hard? Well, Phil, I'm just really strong. Wait a minute, my turn. Okay, one, two, three, go. Yeah! See, pushing down on this one is way easier. You wouldn't it think is. that the small syringe would be easier. Why is that? The reason for it is, is that you have to push this one down a lot farther than you have to push this one down. Okay, see? See, see how oh, far yeah. this one goes and this one's barely This one moving. travels much more. This is how we can exchange a little bit of force over a long distance. That's right. To a, a little bit of distance at a lot of force. That's exactly right. Just like the lever, it's a mechanical advantage. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's hydraulic advantage. That's right. Chris and I push down on small syringes, which gives us more force on our larger syringes. Our crusher was ready to go. Ooh, how about an orange? One, two, three. We squeeze down and... Oh! Oh! <laughs> then we tried a walnut. Are you allergic to nuts? I am not. One, two, three. Oh! Oh! When we tried a golf ball, we reached the limit of what our plastic syringes and our hands could do. We need to come up with a stronger, more awesome crushing machine using hydraulics. That's right, I have some ideas. Okay, good, we can go to, we can use metal. We can use metal. And we can, and use... we can go bigger as well. Ew, this water is gross, but I'm gonna drink this water. Why? Well, because of science. No, but I'm not gonna drink the water like this. First, I'm gonna use the power of science to help me clean it. How? By using gravel. Gravel, yes, gravel. So, say I've got some dirty water, and there are particles floating in that water. Large particles, your rocks, your wood, these styrofoam bits will act as the large particles. You pour it into the gravel, and the large particles get filtered out. See, nothing but clean, clean water. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, Phil, that's not really clean yet. That's because we haven't done step two, sand. Sand? Yes, sand. Let's say that these plastic beads are small particles. That filters out the tinier stuff. There, huh? Clean, right? Uh, no, it's not very clean. So, we filter the water in the next step with charcoal. What? Charcoal? Yes, charcoal. Charcoal works just like gravel and sand, except on a microscopic scale. See, these bits are tiny particles you can't even see. The charcoal catches these like the sand and gravel caught the larger particles. This is called a gravel, sand, and charcoal filter. The gravel catches the big particles, the sand the smaller ones, and the charcoal the microscopic ones. These kinds of filters are used all over the world to clean drinking water. Ah. Delicious. Science. Pressure happens when you squeeze something or compress it. Solids do not compress very well. I will demonstrate. Um, solid? 
Is it compressing? No, okay. Liquids don't compress very well either. You can demonstrate this for yourself by getting a plastic water bottle and filling it right to the very top with water and putting on the cap and squeezing. Ugh, you'll find that you can't really squeeze the bottle very much. But if you empty out half of the water, no, don't pour it on the floor, and then put the cap back on the bottle and try to squeeze it, you'll find that you can squeeze it a lot more. That's because gases compress much easier than solids or liquids. Here's what's going on. Say this container is, well, any container. And these magnets are air molecules. Now, I'm gonna put the magnets in pole to pole so they repel each other and wanna stay a certain distance apart, just like air molecules do. There we go, a container at normal gas pressure. Now, watch what happens when I add more gas molecules. They start to get squeezed together. And if I add more, the amount of space that each one gets is less and less. Now this container is under a lot of pressure. These molecules really want to escape through the top of the container, but they can't because I'm holding them down. If I took something like this plunger and I pushed them down even more, now they're really under pressure. They want to get out, but they can't because I'm holding them in. Now watch what happens when I let them go. They all pop out the top and the container has returned to normal gas pressure. That's what happens when we put gas in a container like this one. These containers that hold compressed gas are made out of solid steel because you need something really strong or it might explode if you put too much gas pressure in it. That's why these are only filled up by professionals who know exactly how much pressure it can take. That is the power of pressure. Our maxed out mousetrap boat isn't the only way to give a boat propulsion. Let's look at another way using a balloon. Let's make a balloon powered boat. All you need for that is something to be your boat and a balloon. Then you attach them together. Actually, the best way to do it is use a straw and attach the balloon to the straw using an elastic band. And then you attach it to your boat using more elastic bands, just like this. I put a nice tape top on the boat to make it look awesome. And I also put a little bit of a riser here using just anything plastic to keep the straw nice and straight because the question is, will our balloon powered boat work better if it's pushing in the air or if it's pushing in the water? Well, let's do a science experiment and find out. First version in the air. <laughs> Oh, almost all the way. Now let's try it with the straw like this so it pushes into the water. Whoa, it works so much better. Why? Because water is denser than air. The air coming out of the straw has to push against something to make the boat move. Water has more mass than air, so pushing against water has a better result. Now, let's max it out. This is an air compressor. Well, actually, that is the air compressor. You see, the engine here pushes air into this tank, which works sort of like the balloon. And then it goes out this long hose, which sort of works like a straw. So let's make a maxed out air powered boat. Ready? Just like the small boat, pushing against the air doesn't produce much thrust. Huh, not so great. But now let's put it in the water. Pushing against the water gives me much more thrust because water is more dense than air. <laughs> Maxed out air powered boat! Maxed out air powered boat! Yeah! Whoa. That's, that's not me. This is hydrophobic coating. Hydrophobic literally means afraid of water, but it's not actually afraid of water. The chemistry of a hydrophobic coating prevents water molecules from penetrating anything you spray it on. You can get this stuff at the hardware store, and if you want, be science maximites, you can get an adult, and think of the coolest thing you could spray with hydrophobic coating. I like to use things that do not go well when you put them in water, like uh, tissue. Yeah, doesn't look great when it gets wet. Here's a tissue coated in hydrophobic coating. Huh? 
Weird. Or it works the same with a paper towel. Paper towel in water, paper towel covered in hydrophobic coating, stays dry. Or how about a dinner roll? Dinner rolls really don't like water. See, gross. But a dinner roll coated in hydrophobic coating? Weird. Just don't eat it. Now, it's time to max it out. I have coated half of my lab coat in hydrophobic coating, and the other half, I have not. Hydrophobic coating, regular lab coat. Half of me is wet, and half of me is dry. What's more, half of my outfit ended up being wet and half dry because the lab coat was protecting my outfit from getting wet. Now it's time to max it out even more. We have coated my entire outfit in hydrophobic spray. My shirt, my pants, and my lab coat. The pants have been taped to rubber boots, so no water's getting in there. And my shirt has been taped to my pants, so no water's getting in there. So here's the question. Can I get into the pool and out of the pool and stay dry? Let's find out. In the pool, out of the pool, and I'm still mostly dry. <laughs> now here's what really happened. I got into the pool, and I realized I should have duct taped the pocket, because all the water went in there, down into the rubber boots, started filling up the rubber boots, and now my entire leg is full of water because the hydrophobic coating isn't letting it come out. So the hydrophobic coating isn't keeping the water out, now it's keeping the water in. Let's take a closer look at Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Okay. All right, let's watch it back. When the sign hits me, I exert a force on the sign in the opposite direction. That makes the sign stop moving. It also exerts an equal force on me, causing me to fly off in this direction. Now, if I was to push this sign, I'm not only pushing the sign this way, but my feet are pushing against the ground in the opposite direction. It's, um, well, it's really easier to see if I'm not standing on the ground. Um, oh, hold on. Okay, so, huh? Oh, okay, so now that I'm hanging, watch, I push, on the sign, but when I exert force on the sign to make it go this way, I go that way. Well, actually, it's, it doesn't work as well because the sign isn't as heavy as I am. So wait, I have this over here. This is a, a barrel, and it has stuff in it, and it weighs as much as I do. Okay, so watch. If I push on the barrel like that, I go away from it as much as it goes away from me. So there you have it. Newton's. Newton's third. No, hold on. Newton's. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. Okay, go. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Inertia. What is it? Well, it's directly related to Newton's first law of motion. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. Let's do an experiment. Here is an object. Right now, it's at rest. You might think that means it has no inertia, but that's not true. Inertia just means an object's tendency to keep doing what it is doing. Right now, it's doing nothing. But if I wanted to overcome its inertia, I would have to put energy in. And now that I have, it is moving on its own. It has inertia. If I wanted to stop it, I would have to overcome its inertia, its tendency to keep moving. There. I went exactly that far. Now, let's max it out. I'm adding uh, these weights to the cart. Now it has a lot more mass, which means it has a lot more inertia and its tendency to do nothing. But this time it has a lot more inertia. If I wanted to get it going the same speed as before, I'd have to put in a lot more effort. Ugh. There, now it's going the same speed as before, but now it has way more inertia, so stopping it will be harder. Ah! Ah! 
So there you go, inertia. Uh, things tend in C2 to stay moving or stay still, and the more mass, the more inertia. <sighs> Dear Phil, I can't believe you did a whole episode on boat propulsion and you didn't use the greatest thing out there for making a boat move, a propeller. Sincerely, a fan. Well, let's talk about propellers. Oh, good thing this is fan mail. <laughs> Get it? Because it's a fan? Anyway. A fan pushes air just like a boat propeller pushes water. They're both fluids and they behave in the same way. Now, if you look closely at a fan, it's curved on the blades. The air or water is caught under at this side and then it's pushed out on the curve to make it go that way. And the faster it spins, the better it works. Now, this is a propeller powered boat. And what you do is wind up the propeller. I have an elastic band here to store the amount of energy I put in and then you put it in the water, the propeller spins, and the boat goes forwards. It's being propelled by the propeller. <laughs> That's why you call it that. Awesome, right? Well, now we'll max it out. This is a drill. It spins. And this is a propeller, and when you put it in the water and spin it, it provides thrust. So let's try it out. Whoa! Remember not to try this at home. I am a trained professional. This is a very small propeller. Let's compare. This, th this is a super maxed out propeller. Whoa, okay, let's try it out. Whoa! The larger a propeller is, the more energy you need to turn it, and the more propulsion you get out. Whoa. This, this is Newton's cradle, and it's a really cool toy that demonstrates all kinds of laws of motion, including Newton's third law. What you do is you pull this one ball out, and when it hits these balls, they exert force on that ball to make it stop moving but it exerts force on these balls, which travels through the balls and makes this one in the end fly out, like that. Now there's a lot going on here, but you can really see how the force is equal that you put in and you get out if you use two balls. I swing two balls up and two balls go out that side. Isn't that cool? Now it wouldn't be science max unless we maxed it out, so come on. Okay, this is one we built out of bowling balls. Bowling balls. Bowling balls. <laughs> Instead of smaller balls. And I think it's gonna work the same way. Let's find out. You throw one out and, and <laughs> yeah, it works the same. Okay, now let's try it with two balls. Okay, ready? Wait, 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 wait. And two balls, throw them out. And two balls on that side. All right, so there you have it. Whoa. Newton's third law. Oh. Ah! Ah! Third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, help, I'm being crushed by all this pressure. A whole kilogram is being pushed down on every square centimeter of my body. 103 kilopascals. Ah! Actually, one kilogram for every square centimeter on your body is the exact kind of pressure that you and I are under at all times every day. We don't notice it because we're used to it, but it sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Well, it is. Here's an experiment you can do with a plastic bottle. Say, at room temperature, there are 10 million air molecules in here. Doesn't really matter how many, but we'll say there's 10 million at normal room temperature. What happens if I heat up the air inside this bottle? This is warm water. What I'm trying to do is heat up the air inside the bottle because the air molecules, when they get hotter, move faster and need more room. So the 10 million air molecules are starting to escape out the mouth of the bottle and reducing the number of air molecules inside. And now I take the bottle out and cap it. Because the air molecules heated up and speeded up, they needed more room. Now there's less of them in the bottle. There's about 4 million air molecules inside this bottle, but they're all hot air molecules and they have a higher pressure. 
and you don't notice it because the air out here isn't crushing the bottle. But watch what happens if I cool the air inside the bottle. This is ice water. So what's happening now is the molecules are slowing down and they need less space. So they need less room and they're being crushed by the pressure on the outside of the bottle. Aha! It has been crushed because the colder air molecules don't need the same kind of room as the hot air molecules. The room temperature air has crushed the bottle. The air inside has a lower pressure than the air outside. Pretty amazing even more amazing when we max it out. This is a steel drum. What we've done is we put some water in it and we're heating it up to boiling so there's nothing but hot air inside the drum. This is an airtight cap, which we use to seal the drum. And now we cool the drum off. Hey, Trevor, give me a hand. Ready? One, two, three, you lift. That's good. This pool is filled with ice. What we're doing now is cooling off the steel drum, which will cool off the air inside it, which means eventually the air inside the steel drum will be a much lower pressure than the air outside the steel drum. Because the steel drum has a lot more volume than a two liter pop bottle, it takes a lot longer for the air to cool down. The other thing to think about is that it's a steel drum. I could stand on it and it wouldn't even dent. But sure enough, after a few minutes... Whoa! Check it out! The barrel has totally crushed. The low pressure air inside the barrel wasn't enough to withstand the force of the regular air pressure that you and I walk through every day. The air pressure all around us is enough to crush a steel drum. How cool is that? Mmm, this science is delicious. This is rock candy. It's basically crystallized sugar, and you make it by turning a solid into a liquid and then back to a solid again. Here's how you can make it at home. You need a container that you're not gonna need for a while and some water, some sugar, you can use brown or white, I like to use brown, and an adult. Here's why you need an adult. You wanna dissolve three cups of sugar into every cup of water, and you can't do that unless you heat the water. So get an adult, a saucepan, and heat the water up, pour the sugar in, and keep stirring until it's all dissolved. Then pour it in your container and let it cool down. Then you'll need a shish kebab skewer, which is something you can get at the grocery store. Cut it down to the right size so it fits nicely into your container. And then dunk it in your sugar and get some crystals coated around the stick. These are seed crystals and they get the whole process started. And now you have to wait for these to dry, otherwise they'll just fall off the stick when you put it in the water. So I've got one here that has dried out. You'll also want something to keep it from falling in the top of the container, so I'm gonna use a clothespin. Put it in there and dunk it in the container like that. And now for the final step, if you want, you can add food coloring. I like to use red because it reminds me of science. And I'm gonna use the stick to actually stir that up a little bit. There we go. Now. The dissolved sugar crystals in the water will slowly grow on the crystals that are already attached to the stick, and it will eventually grow into a rock candy pop. But it takes about a week. No, I'm just kidding. I've already got one that's standing by. Here we go. This one has been growing for about seven days. And there you go, rock candy. Delicious science. Now, how could we make this any better? I mean, it's crystallized sugar. It doesn't get any more maxed out than that, does it? Yeah, it does, come on. This is a giant container of sugar water, and I've been brewing a massive rock candy uh, crystal in it for a while, but uh, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of getting a little bit too big to fit out the top of the container, so, uh, um, you know what, I'm just gonna, Put that back in there and chalk that one up to science because, well, eating a rock candy crystal that big would definitely not be good for my teeth, so, yeah.
Here is something mind-bending you can do with pulleys. These buckets are attached to the table through a pulley. There's nothing holding this table up except for the weight of the buckets pushing down on the table. So if I took the buckets off the table, the weight of the buckets pulls the table up. But because the buckets are on the table, everything is in balance. Mind-bending, right? OK, wait, it gets better. If I took a weight and I put it on the table, the weight of the buckets isn't enough to keep the table up. So I have to add more weight to the buckets so the buckets pull the table up. Whoa. And there you have it. It's weird. It's mind-bending. It's science. Today, we're combining two different chemicals to create a reaction. Sometimes chemicals can combine in a way that makes them very different from how they started out. For example, this is sodium, or Na, on the periodic table. Now, the sodium tablets are in mineral oil because sodium reacts very strongly with water, even the water in the air, or especially the water in my skin. Watch what happens when I drop a sodium tablet into this beaker of water. Very cool and very dangerous. And this is chlorine, or Cl, on the periodic table. Chlorine gas is very poisonous. So, <coughs> so what happens if we combine these two deadly substances? Do we create some sort of super poison? Something more deadly than anything else known to science that causes fear and chaos in chemistry labs all over the land? No, we create salt. Good old normal table salt. These two substances combine to make NaCl, salt. Something completely and totally safe. Chemistry. Oh. Oh, oh. This is a pendulum. It's a weight that swings. It swings back and forth. Pendulums are pretty simple. It, it swings back and forth. Predicting the path of a pendulum, pretty simple. It's going to swing back and forth. But wait, as I make it so much more complex by adding a pendulum. Now I've got a pendulum down here, and that one swings back and forth, and I've got a pendulum up here that swings back and forth. What will happen to this part of the pendulum when I let it go? Can you predict? Let's find out. This is a double pendulum, and predicting the path of a double pendulum is really difficult. It's still simple physics, but because there's a moving part attached to a moving part, it makes it way more complex. So, the question is, can we max it out even more? Of course we can. These are chaos pendulums. This one's a lever, and it's got another lever on the end. Whoa. And this one here is a perfectly balanced lever, and it's got a pendulum on either side. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Scientists and engineers have always said that the more moving parts something has, the more complex they are. Science. <laughs> This is a chain of beads, and this is a uh, glass. Now, if I was to drop the chain of beads, what will happen? It will fall. Yes, that's right. It'll fall because of gravity. But watch this. This side goes up. Why? Because of gravity. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why does one side go up because of gravity? Well, it gets a little complicated, but I can explain. Um, but I think I should I'll have to put the beads back in the glass. OK, so what's going on? Well, when this part of the chain starts falling out, it gets longer and longer, and it has more mass than this side of the chain. And if it has more mass, then it has more inertia. And when it starts yanking out very hard, this side of the chain gets yanked up out of the glass very quickly. When it gets yanked up hard, it flies into the air. But then, of course, the direction has to change, so it goes around a curve and then goes back down. Because of the speed that it's going, that curve starts lifting up over the top of the glass. And that's how it works. There's a big difference in energy because this chain falls far. I try it from here, and it doesn't work as well. Why? Because the drop from here to here isn't as big. You want lots of force acting on the falling chain. 
which means the higher you do it from, the better it works. So maybe we should max it out. Yeah. Oh, wait, we should wait for it to stop. And now let's max it out. This is a really long chain, and this is a really long drop. Let's see what happens. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that. Whoa! Super maxed out! Science! Now we're gonna talk about tension. What's tension? One more than nine shin. Get it? Because tension and nine shin, that's, okay, I'll, um, because I, tension is the force that we usually talk about when we think about pulling a rope or a chain or something like that, because you know the old expression, you can't push a rope. But today we are gonna push a rope. I have a rope right here, and I'm going to push it using another force called flexion. I've got some pieces of plastic here, and they bend or flex. And when they do, they want to spring back. But I'm going to prevent them from springing back by putting them in between these knots. Huh? And look, the rope now stays up. And I take another piece, and I stick it on this knot, and then I bend it all the way. This is not terrifying. Really, it's not terrifying at all. Oh, OK, good. And then I take this piece, and I put it here, and I bend it around, and... <gasps> so now we have a rope that's being pushed, and we're defying gravity, and we're making a cool art sculpture. All right, one more here. Ooh, okay, here we go. And, and, flexing. And, whoa. Ha-ha! There you go! I've pushed a rope, defied gravity, and made a cool art sculpture. Okay, well, I guess technically I haven't really pushed the rope because we're still pulling from each knot. And I guess I haven't really defied gravity because that one's sitting on the table and all the others are sitting on top of that. But you can't argue that I made a cool art sculpture. Ha-ha! Art! I mean, science! Here is an experiment you can do at home with friction. This is... A toy boat. Yes, you guessed that right. And this is a wooden plank. Correct, that's two for two. I put the boat on the ramp and watch what happens. Nothing! The reason why is because the friction between the boat and the ramp is enough to counteract the force of gravity trying to pull it down. But watch what happens if I raise the ramp to the right height, the boat slides down because the friction isn't enough and gravity pulls it down. But when we change surfaces to this carpet, let's see what happens. Same angle. I can raise it higher, 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 because there's more friction between the carpet and the boat than there was between the wood and the boat. Better sandcastles in 80 seconds. Building sandcastles is fun, but you can't use dry sand because it doesn't stay up very well. You have to use wet sand. But even if you use wet sand, it doesn't hold a lot of weight. But if you use sand with the power of science, it does hold the weight. Dry sand, wet sand, science sand. Here's what's going on. Say these ping pong balls are grains of sand. When they're dry, they don't hold together very well. That's why you can't build a sand castle out of dry sand. But if you get the sand wet a little bit, the grains of sand will hold together a little better because of the surface tension of the water. That's why it's easier to build a sandcastle with wet sand, but they still won't hold much weight. But if you add something that creates even more friction between the grains of sand, like say, this sandpaper, it will hold the weight. So here's what you do. Take window screen and cut it into circles. Make sure you get an adult's permission first, okay? Deal? Put in a layer of sand, pack it down, and put in a circle of window screen. And a layer of sand, pack it down, circle of window screen. Then 
You guessed it, layer of sand, pack it down. Circle of window screen. The window screens are gonna add more friction between the grains of sand and will make your sand castle strong. Strong with the power of science. And then uh, you can put lots of weight on it. And there you go. Sand with the power of science. <laughs> okay, I had to max it out. Let's see how strong science sand really is. Huh? <laughs> science! <laughs> Moving air is a lot of fun, especially if you use one of these, a Vortex Cannon. They're pretty impressive and they use some pretty amazing science. I'll show you how to build one. It's pretty simple. All you need is a plastic cup. You want a balloon, something round, an elastic, scissors or a craft knife, and a pen. Here's what you do. Take your balloon and cut it just where it gets wide. You take the mouth of the cup right there and you have to stretch the balloon over the top. And then you wanna put an elastic around it, keep it in place. And this now is a surface on the top and that's what you're gonna use to pull back and create your burst of air. But of course the air's not gonna go anywhere until you make a hole in the bottom. So here's what you do. You take your round thing and draw a circle and Take your craft knife or scissors and an adult and get them to help you cut out a hole. And when you pull back on the balloon, a burst of air comes through the hole. But the air has an interesting shape. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, air is invisible. You can't tell what shape it is. Well, I can show you. Come on. This is my maxed out Vortex Cannon. It's made out of a garbage can. I've got a hole in here, and this is a shower curtain with a ball that I can get a grip on and pull. And then it shoots forward like this. Now it makes a big puff of air, but again, the air is invisible, so we don't know what shape it is, but I can help with that because I've got this, a fog machine. I fill the inside of the garbage can so we can see what the air is doing when I fire the vortex again. Okay, come on over here. Ready? Whoa. Okay, ready? Check it out. The vortex cannon shapes the air into a ring called a vortex. It makes a ring, well, actually sort of a donut. Because of its shape, the air in a vortex can move much farther than air that doesn't have a shape. Vortex cannon. Air that has a shape goes a lot further than air that doesn't have a shape. And it's also way more fun. Woohoo! This is a climbing frog. Why does he climb? Because of science. I pull on this rope, and then I pull on that rope, and I pull on that rope, and that rope, and he climbs up the ropes. And why? Well, because of friction. The secret is two straws. The straws are pointed away from each other at the bottom. This allows it to climb thanks to friction. Take a closer look. When I pull on one string, it pulls straight, which makes the frog pivot. That string slips through the straw because there's not a lot of friction, but there's lots of friction on the other side because of the angle. So one side of the string goes down, which makes the other go up, which means the frog goes up with it, all thanks to friction. So now, let's max it out. This is a super maxed out uh, climbing frog. Just like the small version, I have a rope going through two tubes. I pull on one rope and the other holds on by friction. Then I switch. And it does work. It's just a lot harder to pull on the ropes. Uh, but it totally works. Whoa, guess what? There, and then this one, and then that one, and then that one. Yeah! <laughs> a giant climbing frog! <laughs> <laughs> All because of friction. Here's another way to defy gravity using friction. Get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice. Take two. So get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice using a funnel.
Then take a shish kebab skewer and stick it into the bottle and nothing happens. <laughs> but if you tap the bottle down, the rice starts to pack in a little bit better. See how the level of rice is lower? Which means you can add more rice. Pack it down even more. And you can even use something the same diameter as the mouth of the bottle, like, say, a highlighter. And make sure all the rice is as packed in as you can get it there. Now the rice is really packed in there. And when I stick the shish kebab skewer in, the friction between the pieces of rice and this wood is enough to lift the bottle using nothing but friction. Now, let's max it out. I filled this 20 liter water cooler jug full of rice and it's really, it's really heavy. I wanted to see if I could lift it using nothing but friction and this dowel, which is just a round piece of wood. All right, here we go. Ah, <laughs> science! I'd max it out even more, but I don't think I could lift anymore. It's okay, I could just fit. Um. Newton's first law in 60 seconds. Newton's first law says an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So, why don't they? See, if I was to throw this, it doesn't stay in motion, it doesn't keep going, it slows down and falls to the ground. Well, the whole law states an object in motion tends to stay in motion until an external force acts upon it. So what forces are acting upon this? Well, gravity for one, pulling it down towards the ground, and friction, specifically air friction, slowing this down and making it stop. Now, if you were to have something very light with a lot of surface area, it would really be affected by air friction. You wouldn't be able to throw it very far at all, no matter how hard you tried. So there you go. Newton's first law, an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless it's affected by an external force such as friction, like air friction. So there you go. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be looking at earthquakes. Earthquakes. Huh. Today, we're going to be looking at how to build something. <laughs> that was supposed to happen earlier. Today, we're going to be looking at how to build something that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake. Earthquakes happen when two plates on the Earth's surface rub together, and it causes the ground to shake. It causes the ground to shake. Sometimes it shakes a little, sometimes it shakes a lot. Chances are you do not live in a place that has earthquakes. But if you do, ask an adult what to do during an earthquake so you can be safe. Modern buildings that are built in earthquake zones are designed to withstand the shaking. But how do scientists and engineers build a building that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at today. First thing we have to do is simulate an earthquake. We're going to build a shaker table. And here's what you need. Two books and... Two books, four elastic bands, and four... four rubber balls. Oh, wait. Uh, okay, <laughs> four, four rubber balls. All right, so the first thing you do is actually take your four elastic bands and wrap them around your books. Put one set on one side, one set on the other side until you have that. Then you take your four balls and you stick them in between the books in the middle-ish area, but you don't want to have them too close to the edges. And now two at the back. And ta-da, you've made your own shaker table. What are you shaking, you ask? I will show you. You build a tower, like this one here that I built out of building blocks. So here's what you do. You'll need your base to be securely attached to the shaker table. I use painter's tape because it'll come off again without harming the books. And what I want to find out is just how much shaking this tower can take before it falls apart. Ready? And there it goes. And when you've done that, 
What you do is you be a science maximite and you design another tower. And you tape it down to your shaker table and see if you can make this tower fall down in an earthquake. And if you built it really well, probably won't. Haha. <laughs> but you don't have to just use building blocks. There's all kinds of other materials you can use. Check out this building, which is really tall, and you'll see there's a cup at the top. And that's for a baseball. Put it up at the top, and that means there's a weight up there. And then we shake it, and we see what happens. Oh, oh no! no! There it goes. This is water. Things float on water, like pool noodles and wood and toy boats. And now we're gonna do an experiment with how paint floats on water. How's this supposed to work again? Oh! I'm supposed to take the paint out of the can first. This is a fun experiment you can do at home. All you need is a container, some water, and paint. But not just any paint, special paint you use for hydro dipping. That's hydro, meaning water, and dipping, meaning dipping. Carefully pour the paint on the water and add a few different colors. Then take a stick to swirl it up into a pattern. Then you get something you wanna paint, and you carefully put it in like so, but don't pull it out as soon as you get it in. You have to spread the paint away because it'll stick when you bring it back out. And then when you pull it out, whoa, hydro dip. Let that dry and then you have a very cool painted toy. Let's do some other stuff. This is a bike helmet. If you put tape on what you're painting, you can remove it later to make parts that aren't painted. Skateboard! Whoa. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Now to max it out. Hydro dip pants! Wearing the pants when you do this is super messy and not something you should try at home. But the results weren't bad. <laughs> Science pants! Science pants! Science pants. One of the ways you can experience the power of water is watching it wash away dirt. You can experiment with this yourself by making your own erosion table. To make your own, fill a plastic tub with sand and tilt it up. Cut a hole in the tub at the low end and put a hose with a trickle of water at the high end. Then to complete your model, fill it with a little happy town. This small model shows how rivers cut their course to the ocean by following the lowest point. Try to design your town and the layout of the ground so the river goes around the buildings. I'll see you later. I'm gonna take a swim in the river now. There are lots of ways to experiment. Change the amount of water or the steepness of the angle. Look at the soil, it's all getting eroded over here. Or the way the town is laid out. Every time you do it, the river goes in a different direction. And have fun. Oh, phew, I'm, I'm tired, I'm just gonna lie down. And that is the power of water. Nothing like a fizzy glass of water. And now there are ways for you to carbonate water at home with something like this, the Science Max Carbonation Station. You have a bottle of compressed carbon dioxide gas that's hooked up. You take a bottle of tap water, attach it, and carbonate it. Voila, carbonated water. But this is Science Max. Why just carbonate water? Let's carbonate everything! Let's carbonate pickle juice. <laughs> it's actually amazing. <laughs> milk. It's like milk meets water. Kind of very odd. Chocolate milk? Oh no, that's way better. <laughs> Carbonated mustard. <laughs> carbonated tomato juice, carbonated hot sauce. No, wait, carbonated, that was the hot sauce. <laughs> no. <laughs> carbonated clam chowder. Oh, there you go, carbonation. Not just for water anymore. It is definitely not for clam chowder. No, that's just a big bowl of no. Never again. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and it's moving day today on Science Max Experiments at Large. 
Let's see, where do I put this? Uh, this is probably a good spot. <laughs> Today, we are moving air. You probably don't think that moving air will have a huge effect, but you'd be surprised what you can do by just moving air. But don't worry, we're not just gonna move the air around in boxes. We are going to build a rocket! And this rocket uses the science of stomping on something with your foot. This is a stomp rocket, and it works by stomping on this plastic bottle, and air shoots through this tube and pushes the rocket up into the sky. And here is how you can build one of your very own. And remember, if I go too fast, don't worry. All of the steps are on the website, so you can follow along at your own speed. All you need is a two liter plastic bottle, three kinds of tape electrical tape, duct tape, and science tape. Science tape is just the same as invisible tape, but I use this kind of tape for science. Then you want some plumber's tubing and some construction paper to make your actual rocket. First, you wanna take your plumber's tubing and cut it into three lengths. And when I say you, I mean an adult, because you need to use a saw. So you saw it up into a long piece, a short piece, and an elbow piece. We want to make a long tube at the top, and then we also want to make a tube at the bottom so we can attach our two liter bottle to. And there we go, ta-da, ready to go. But of course, it doesn't stay up, so we have to attach it to a base. And it will look like this. And you see, it's been attached with duct tape here, and I've used electrical tape, and I've wrapped that part around there. Now, building the rocket. Wrap the paper around the tube and tape it with your science tape. Tape the top closed so no air escapes. Then cut a semicircle to make the nose cone and three hoops for thrusters and tape them to the bottom. There you go. The rocket fits on the tube just like that. And when you stomp on this bottle, it launches. But here's the most important part. The one most important rule of launching rockets. You shoot rockets outside. Come on. Once you get outside to a nice open area and you bring your safety glasses with you, all you need to do to make the stomp rocket work is, of course, stomp on it. You ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. Whoa! You see that? That was amazing. Today, we're taking a closer look at chemistry. Ooh. Chemistry is the science of atoms and molecules, the things that make up all matter, and how they interact with each other. Take, for example, this glow stick. Actually, don't take it, because I, I, I kind of need it. The glow stick doesn't glow until you... Um, the glow stick doesn't glow until you break the barrier and mix the two chemicals, and they start to glow. Huh? Pretty cool, huh? Chemistry. Now, the chemical reaction we're looking at today is the old vinegar and baking soda volcano. But this reaction doesn't have anything to do with volcanoes. It's chemistry. Now, this experiment is totally safe, but I do recommend you get an adult's permission before you do it because it's very messy. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> First, you're gonna want baking soda and vinegar, these are your two main ingredients. But you'll also want dish soap and red food coloring if you want it to look a little bit more like lava. Now, I like to mix the baking soda, red food coloring, and dish soap together with a little warm water, so all you have to do is add the vinegar. And when you do, this is what happens. And there you go, chemical reaction. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how much vinegar or baking soda do I use? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. This is where you can be science maximites. Try different amounts. More vinegar, more baking soda, more dish soap. Who knows? Write down the amounts each time you use it and find out what amounts work best. That's called science. Here's another fun way you can play with elastic force. Take a milk carton. I prefer science max milk because it's the creamiest. 2% cream, 100% science. Wrap some elastic bands around it with some popsicle sticks on the bottom, sort of like feet. 
Then take some clamshell packaging, which wraps just about anything you buy nowadays, and cut out a square or a rectangle. Then wrap some tape around that square with an elastic in it and put the elastic on the feet of your milk carton. Then wind it around and make sure you go backwards so your paddle wheel boat will go forwards when you put it in the water. And there you go, a paddle wheel boat. Now it is time to max it out. Ahoy, the SS maxed out elastic force paddle wheel boat mattress. I need, I need a, a better name. But I've made a giant paddle wheel boat that will work on elastic force because I've got surgical tubing as my elastics and that's an air mattress. And then I use some lumber to hold it all together. And of course I need a paddle wheel and what better thing to use in a pool than a flutter board. Okay, here we go. So normally you're not allowed to wear your clothes and your shoes in the pool, but I got special permission because of science. Besides, I'm not worried at all, so I didn't wear my swimming outfit because I figure I can totally do this entire experiment without even getting wet. That is how confident I am. All right, now the tricky part, we'll be getting onto the mattress. Okay, here we go. Ha <laughs> ha, whoa. Ha-ha! The SS Science! Hey, SS Science, that's a great name for this. Look, it works great, and I meant to say, totally dry. Huh? Well, almost. Whoa, oh, oh. Ha-ha, <laughs> you thought I was gonna fall in the pool, but I didn't. Uh-oh. My flutterboard has has stopped moving and I'm, I'm in the middle of the pool. Almost. Yeah. Didn't think this through. No. 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 No, that's not going to work. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll wait. If you want to build a block tower, you might think the fastest way to do it is just by building a single stack of blocks. But science may have a few things to say about that, and those things would be no. And let's try it with books. The books are much wider than the blocks, so that will give me a wider base, right? But it's all about the center of mass. You compare how wide it is to how tall it is. Right now, it's pretty wide and it's not that tall, so the center of mass might be around here. But if you go high enough, how high it is compared to how wide it is changes a lot. It's getting higher, but not any wider. The center of mass is probably uh, right around there somewhere, which means it's gonna be really hard to balance that. Whoa, care careful, almost. I can do a little bit more, I bet. Oh, careful, careful. Whoa. It'll only get so tall. So there you go. You can never stack a single stack of anything very high. But just in case you don't believe me, let's max it out. Ah, ha ha, oh, careful. Now it's time to see how high, whoa, whoa, how high I can make a single stack of boxes. Okay, and it, whoa, six boxes, six boxes, six boxes, whoa. Can he go as high as 12? Let us find out if I can go as high. Apparently not. Can he go as high as 11? Can he go as high as 11 boxes? Let's find out. Oh, careful. 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 And. Ha-ha! A single stack of boxes! Huh. OK, well, like I said, you can't stack a single stack of things too high, because it will, it will fall. Ha-ha. Science! 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 This is a pencil. You probably have one of these at home and use it for all kinds of interesting things like writing and drawing 
and that may be it. But if you have a lot of pencils, you can build stuff. I'll show you some of my favorite pencil builds. Check this out. It's a pencil cube. If you want to try building one yourself, you build it like this. Get a piece of foam and then lay out 11 pencils this way, and then another 11 that way, so they make a nice square. Then take sharpened pencils and stick them into the foam in all the gaps. Go all the way around and then keep adding more layers of pencils and eventually you will have a cube. Now, if you don't have 366 pencils at home, you can do the same thing with toothpicks. Now, if you want to research this on your own to find the instructions, just try looking up pencil cube. Okay, that's not the only thing we can build with pencils. Check this out, a pencil asterisk. Phil, can you max it out and add some more pencils? Yeah, so I did. I maxed it out with even more pencils. And then I thought, well, could I max it out again? So I did. This is what it looks like with even more pencils. And in fact, I removed the inside pencils and the whole thing still stays together. And then of course, this is the maximum number of pencils you can do with this configuration because as you can see, it starts to become a sphere and you kind of run out of pencil length. There you go, maxed out pencil structures. Of course, I've used all of my pencils, but that's okay, I will buy some more. I will just write myself a note to buy more. Actually, there are sharpened pencils on the bottom of my pencil cube, so I'll just, I'll just, I'll just write this note with the pencil cube. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, ready? One, two, three. And it's still standing! Oh, that one's not sharpened. Oh, here we go. Where'd my book go? This is a house of cards, and if you've never built a house of cards, you should definitely try. Try, because it's not easy. What you need to do is you need to make triangles with the cards. If you do it just right, ha ha, they'll stay up. Then you take another pair of cards, like that, you take another card and you put it on top. Ah, and it stays up. Keep on building by making triangles and putting another card across the top like a roof. Then, when you're ready, you can start to make a second layer. It takes a lot of patience to make a house of cards. But with enough patience and really steady hands, you might be able to finish it. There we go. Ha ha, a house of cards. Now, let's max it out. Shh, backing away slowly, backing away slowly. To build our maxed out card house, the Science Max build team and I used large pieces of foam insulation, which were super light and easy to work with. Once we set up the first layer, we needed to bring in a scissor lift so we could keep building the next layers. By the time we got to the top, our card house was 10 meters tall. Yeah, giant house of cards. And now that I've built a giant house of cards, what do I do with it? I knock it down. I'm gonna build it again. Plastic is great and plastic is everywhere. But the problem with plastic is it isn't very biodegradable. It, it doesn't break down in the environment. <laughs> I'm still on hold. Oh well, there you go. Back for another couple years, I guess. But here's a way that you can make bioplastic. It's fully biodegradable because it's made of natural materials. The recipe is easy. Two parts cornstarch, three parts water a few drops of cooking oil, and some food coloring to make it whatever color you want. Purple, science purple. Mix it up and it turns into a paste. Now what you'll need are two things. One, an adult, and two, a microwave. Put it in for 30 seconds. Clock wipe. There we go. Then take it out and mix it some more until it cools down. Then you can pull it out and use your hands to sculpt it into a shape or take the shape of something else. Once you put it all the way around, you can turn it into a little flower pot. 
once you've sculpted it, you need to wait for it to dry, which will take about a day. Clock wipe. After waiting a day... Uh, uh, huh? Uh, what? It's been a day? Oh. You have something made out of bioplastic, like this little flower pot you can use to grow a small plant. And then when it grows big enough, you can take this biodegradable flower pot and plant it right outside in the dirt, and this pot will biodegrade and turn back into dirt. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's max it out. Biodegradable Frisbee! Check it out! It's a Frisbee, but it's biodegradable. So you throw it around in the park, but if you lose it, it turns back into dirt. <laughs> what, not enough? Okay, clock wipe! Biodegradable lawn chair! Use it for one season and then return it to the earth afterwards. I think this is one of my best science max. I Okay, bioplastic lawn chair, not as strong as regular lawn chair. We've learned that lesson now, so that's, that's good to know. I mean, I mean, how would I have known if I hadn't tried it? Hello, oh, greetings science maximites. My name is Phil, and I think I might have overdone it with the science. I mean, what's a better use of science than creating a whole bunch of slime? Well, I did, and you know what? It's really cool. <laughs> slime. I love slime. It always makes me feel like a mad scientist, but I need a good mad scientist laugh. <laughs> yeah, it needs work. Anyway, today we're talking about polymers. Polymers like slime. But you see, polymers aren't really a substance. They're more how something is constructed. And there's all kinds of different polymers. There's slime, obviously, and rubber polymers, like, well, like rubber. And there's also hard polymers, like plastic. Now, polymers are all kind of constructed the same way, like this. This is a chain. Yeah, so imagine this is a chain of molecules and all the molecules are the same and they just repeat in a long line. Now, when you get a polymer like slime, all the chains are not connected or very loosely connected, which means that they can flow over each other like a slime or sort of like a liquid and they behave like that. So that is slime. But when you get to a rubber polymer, you start to get little bonds in between the chains of polymers that work like this. You see, they still move around a little bit, but they can, they can spread apart and they become flexible and bouncy. Yeah, I know, a chain, a chain doesn't really bounce, but rubber polymers do. Huh? Now, when it gets to a solid polymer like plastic, there's a lot more links and it's all kind of interconnected and it doesn't move at all. It doesn't move, okay, again, harder to tell with a chain, but plastic is very hard and rigid. So let's dive into the world of polymers and make some slime. <laughs> yeah, too mad, not enough scientist. I'll keep working on it. Anyway, to make slime, take your white glue and pour in uh, an amount. It really kind of depends on how much slime you want to make. Now, you want to add about twice as much water as that. Uh, yeah, somewhere around there, great. Now we want to put in just a little bit of soap. Maybe there, that's good. And you want to put in your food coloring. I like green. Green seems like the right slime color to me. It's the right appropriate mad scientist kind of slime. And then you want to start mixing that up till you get the right kind of consistency. That means make sure the glue and the water are equally mixed up. Good. And now we're ready to make it an actual slime by bonding the polymers together by adding liquid starch. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you want to mix it up. When you add the liquid starch, it starts to bond the chains of molecules together, changing it from a liquid to a slime. It's coming along. And there you go. Slime. Now, if you want clear slime and not opaque slime, you want to use clear glue and not white glue. But that's basically the recipe. So there you go. Slime. <laughs> Too super villain? Yeah, okay, well, anyway, we go. All right. This is a bike tire. It's pretty light, but I still can't hold it from the end of the pole like this with one hand. Nope, nope. 
but I can if I get it spinning fast enough. I just use this drill and then I get, okay, so this is gonna be awfully hard to do with one person. Uh, oh, this is the perfect opportunity to use the Trevor button. <laughs> Trevor button. Hey, Trevor from the Science Max build team. Uh, what are you doing? Maxing this out. Oh, right on. Can you give me a hand for a second? Sure. Awesome. Okay, so you take this, this drill and we're gonna get this wheel spinning really fast. Okay. I don't know if it's... Um, no, no, I don't wanna know. I don't know if I remembered to... No, it's fine. Max it out. We gotta max it out. So, because it's spinning, I can hold this heavy weight in the air. How is this possible? Because the wheel is basically a top. The forces that prevent a top tipping, angular momentum, are still working here. This angular momentum resists a change in direction this way, which is how gravity would want it to tip. Interestingly, these same forces also keep it spinning around me in a circle. So, I can lift a heavy weight in the air just by spinning it. Awesome max head experiment, Trevor. Yeah! What was that? It's my science confetti high five I just made. Well, you know what we should do? What? We should max it out. Yeah, we can make a giant one and then a whole bunch of confetti in it, and then people like jump up and do more confetti that would come out, right? And then so what would happen is there would be all this con Trevor? 